So tonight, we are continuing in our series, The Bible is Good for You. This is week number five of The Bible is Good for You. So, does anybody know what we talked about the very first week of this series? That is correct, but what? Yes, that's correct, yeah. Abraham and Isaac, we talked about the faith of Abraham, and then the second week we talked about, also from Genesis, Uh, Joseph, Joseph. yep, and the sovereignty of God, all that stuff, awesome. Third week, Moses and the Exodus, bringing Israel out of Egypt, right? Moses and the Exodus. And then last week, what did we talk about? Who's that? Dude, you're on it. Jericho. We talked about Jericho, the walls coming down. Absolutely. So this week, we're going another book forward. We're in Judges. So you can open up to Judges chapter 6. Hopefully you have a copy of God's Word. If you don't, there's a whole table back there. You can grab a Bible. I'd love for you to grab a Bible if you don't have one. That would be great. I love it when you're there with me in the Scriptures. Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6, we're going to be looking specifically at, I'm saying Joshua, I meant Judges. My bad, my bad. Marla's got my back. Marla's got my back, I heard her. He's saying Joshua. He's supposed to say Judges. We're in Judges. Yes, that is correct. Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. That's where we're going to be tonight. But as usual, we need some context on the book of Judges, so we're going to give a little overview of the book of Judges really quick. So when we look at Judges, we see that basically, I've talked about it a few times in the past five weeks, but there's this cycle that Israel's going through in the history of Israel, right? They have this cycle of sin, and so they're failing, they're sinning, and then God rescues them, like they sin, and then basically all kinds of bad things happen to them, oppression, slavery, and then God rescues them, and then there's some peace for a little while, and then they go back into that whole cycle again. And so Judges, if you've ever read the book of Judges, it is a really depressing look at that cycle, like really focused in on that cycle, because it happens over and over again. They sin, they fall into oppression, God sends a judge to rescue them. And, and don't think about judge like we think about judge today in a courtroom. It's a judge like um, somebody, that's, that's what they call the person that comes and rescues Israel and leads them out. Um, and so he sends a judge, the judge rescues them, they have a time of peace, and then they kind of go back down into the bad stuff. So uh, let's look really quick at five milestones from the book of Judges. The first one is failure to drive out. The book of Judges begins by telling us that Israel hasn't completely driven out the Canaanites out from the land. And so instead, uh, Israel falls into corruption, right? They fall into corruption from the Canaanites. Basically, child sacrifice is like the worst of it, um, but having like statues of other gods at their house that they worship and bow down to, that's like also really, really bad, but that's part of it too. So child sacrifice, all the way to idols in their house, all the stuff, they're falling into corruption because they failed to drive out the Canaanites from the land, right? They failed to do what God called them to do. Another milestone is a destructive cycle, right? The cycle that we've been talking about over and over and over again, Israel sins against God. This leads to oppression from their enemies. This leads to sorrow and repentance from Israel, right? They cry out and then God shows mercy on them and raises up a judge to deliver them. And that leads uh, to a little bit of time of peace. And so we see that destructive cycle continuing to go and go and go. But in the book of Judges, number three, we see the character of the judges, right? The whole book is like kind of a decline into sinfulness and destruction. And so even in the character of the judges, the book highlights six different judges. And in the story of the last three judges, their corruption is seen with increased clarity, So they're getting more and more corrupt. The judges are being more and more corrupt. Tonight, we're gonna kind of mention Gideon. I was planning on doing the whole talk on Gideon, but I didn't even get there. I was like, this is too important. We need to talk about this, but we'll kind of mention Gideon. But it starts with Gideon. Gideon kind of forgets who God is. Uh, Jephthah doesn't know God's character. And then Samson lives corruptly. He lives completely contrary to God's law. So we see this decline of the judges and their character. 
And the fourth milestone, total corruption. So the book ends with this private army raiding a temple and then burning a city to the ground. All right, in other words, there was no governing structure and the people did as they pleased. This became, uh, this becomes disturbingly clear in the last chapters of the book of Judges. And so all of that to say, number five, they need a king. So there's a need for a king. The only thread of hope left is the line at the very end of the book that in those days, Israel had no king. And the only hope that Israel had was for a king. So those are five milestones from the book of Judges. Uh, Tonight, I want to hone in on one passage. So Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Let me get my jug again. Stay hydrated, y'all. Hydrate or dihydrate? Rules to live by. You think I can drink this whole thing while I'm doing the talk tonight? Mm Mm-mm. That's not safe. Don't dare me. I could totally do it, but I'm not going to. All right. Y'all got me all messed up with this Hobbit game tonight. My nose is running. I've had a COVID test. Don't worry. It's okay. I mean, I've had like the vaccine and all the stuff. It's okay. I'm fine. We're fine. All right. Judges chapter six, verses one through 10. Does anybody want to volunteer to read? I don't really do this. It's normally like crickets. What? You want to do it? Do it. Judges six, one through 10. Let's get a hand for Stephanie while we're at it, actually. There you go. Stephanie is the tribute tonight. Okay, listen carefully and follow along as Stephanie reads Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Whoa. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave this into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel until Israel was no more. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go up, I have heard the cry of the people of Israel, and the cries of Israel, and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planned to cross, the Midianites and Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock in their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so that they laid waste the land as they came in. Yet Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery, and I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all who oppressed you, and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, for you have not obeyed my voice. Boom. Okay, so what did I say about the cycle of the book of Judges? They sin, they forget God, they disobey God, they fall into oppression from their enemies, and then what happens? They cry out, and then what does God do? He raises up a... A what? (laughs) Did you say a goo? What What did you say? He raises up a judge, right? What happens in this passage? Does he raise up a judge in this passage? It's a prophet, right? This is weird. Okay, so we're going to talk about that in a minute. But let's, let's break it down, okay? Let's do a little breakdown. Nope, not there yet. Let's do a breakdown. First one, it says that they were doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Translation for that, they were idol worshiping. Okay, and here, and we're not, we're not going to read the whole passage tonight, but later on in chapter 6, we see a judge is raised up, and he is told to go and destroy uh, these idols, these idols to the, to the god Baal and, and these Asherah poles and all this stuff, this weird idol worship stuff. He's called to go and like destroy that stuff. This is in Israel. It's in his own family's house. And then Israel and all the people that are there get super angry and they want to have him put to death because he destroys these false idols, right? Like they're breaking super important commands here. Like they're forgetting who God is. And so they're doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Verses one and two, their evil yields results. Their evil yields results. So it says that God gave them into the hands of Midian. That basically says he's, he's not protecting them, right? We've talked over and over and over again the last couple of weeks that God is their protector. God is their strength. God is the only way that they are able to have victory in these battles that they're fighting. 
And so God is not protecting them in this moment. And so their rebellion yields results. God did not protect them. They had sinned and rebelled against God, and they were not deserving of his protection. And so they, they, were, they were forced from their homes. They had to go and make shelter for themselves in this hard-to-access mountain range. It's just not a good time. Like, their, their rebellion is coming back on them, and they're having a terrible, terrible time. Verse 3, the enemies wanted plants, not power. Okay, the enemies wanted plants, not power. So uh, the Midianites, uh, who is it? What does it say? The Amalekites and the Midianites, is that right? So the Amalekites and the Midianites, they come in and they take the crops of Israel and then they leave, right? They come in and they take their stuff and then they go. So they're not wanting to rule over Israel with like political power. They're wanting to take their stuff. They're wanting their props, prop, crops. They're wanting their produce, right? Plants, not power, Okay. Plants, not power. So, the four, verses four and five, this brought harsh conditions, right? Imagine, I mean, if you're living off of crops and produce, and then somebody comes in and takes all of it, not going to go well, right? You're not going to have anything to eat. It's not going to be good. So, this brought harsh conditions. They would sweep in. It says they swept in like what? What are you laughing about? <laughs> We're just laughing. <laughs> That's hilarious. I don't know. They swept in like what? Locust. Locust, right? Can you imagine the the picture of like this caravan of people coming to just take your stuff and your food and you're watching it all go away. You can't do anything about it because the Lord is not protecting you. They're just coming in like locusts and they're taking it all and they're taking the livestock and they're taking all the stuff. Well, yeah, but then it says in the passage that they took the livestock too. It's just a thing. So... It says in verse one that it went on for seven years. So these were hard seven years. This was a tough time, right? Not an easy time. Verse six, they hit rock bottom, okay? Rock bottom. Finally, we see that the Israelites were brought so low that they cried out to God. And it's interesting though that they cried out to God and then a few verses later, which again, we're not gonna get to that part of the passage, but they still have these false idols in their homes, um, so they're crying out to God. And then verses seven and eight, God sends a sermon, not a savior. And this is what hit me when I was studying for this passage. Um, and so this is kind of where we're going to camp out in verses eight and 10, eight to 10. But God sends a sermon, not a savior. This is the part, uh, basically Israel has hit rock bottom and they finally cry out to God. And then God's response is raising up a prophet instead of a judge uh, he sends them a sermon instead of somebody that's going to physically rescue them out of, out of the stuff. So that, that's, that's the first step. And normally their first step would be he sends them a judge and the judge gets them out of it. Uh, but that's not what happens here. He sends a prophet. And the prophet's not named, but Tim Keller, he wrote a book on judges. And he says, before they can appreciate the rescue that will come, the people needed to understand why they need rescuing. Okay? So the same goes for us. Before we can understand... The magnitude of our salvation in Christ, we have to understand why we need a Savior. We have to understand why we need a Savior before we can understand the magnitude of what Christ has done for us. Okay, verses 8 to 10 is the sermon. So the purpose of the sermon is to convict the people, right? To convict the people of their sins and move them to repentance. And this short little sermon is just, like I said, it's just a couple verses, but God reminds them of a few really important things. One, he reminds them who he is, right? He's the one true God. He reminds them what he has done, right? He delivered them. He has redeemed them, right? He brought them into the promised land. He was their protector. Number three, he reminded them who they are. Right? They're God's people. They have forgotten this. They are the people of God, the one true God, yet they've forgotten that, obviously, because they're worshiping other gods. So if they're the people of the one true God and they're worshiping other gods, they've forgotten who they were. So he reminds them who they are. And then he reminds them what they've done. They've disobeyed God. Right? That's that last little verse right there at the end of, chapter, of verse 10. Right? He says, but you have not obeyed my voice. And so he reminds them who he is, what he has done, who they are, and what they've done. So then we come to God's purpose, right? We come to God's purpose. God sends this prophet to convict the people of their sin before he sends the judge to rescue them. Why? 
Why would he do that? He did that because, like a minute ago, I mentioned they still had these idols in their houses, right? They still had these idols in their homes. And so they, they were sorry for what was happening to them. They were sorry for the circumstances and the consequences of their sin, but they weren't sorry for their sin, right? They were regretful. They weren't repentant. So God sends this, this prophet to give this sermon because they were regret, regretful. They weren't repentant. So uh, what's the difference? Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse 10 says, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So we've got this, this contrast between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow, okay? We need to understand that to understand what the people are dealing with and why God would send someone who has a message before he sends the Savior to actually rescue them, right? So worldly sorrow versus godly sorrow, I think I have a, yep, look at that. Worldly sorrow versus godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is regret, sorrow over the consequences of sin, right? Have you ever gotten in trouble and you say you're sorry and then whoever's the, the judge over that trouble, like parent, teacher, whoever it is, says, you're not sorry for what you did, you're sorry because you got caught. Have you ever heard that? Who's ever heard that? Come on, we hear. I, I say it to my kids all the time. They're two and four. So, You're sorry for that you got caught. You're not sorry for what you did. And so worldly sorrow is sorry for getting caught, not sorrow for what you did, right? So that's worldly sorrow. They felt sorry for themselves because of their sin. Their sin had led to them not having food, for them not having homes. They're sorry for that, right? They're sorry for the consequences that they're living in. Because at some level, they have to know that their sin got them into this, but they're they're not sorry for their sin because they like their sin. Right? But they're sorry for the situation that they're in now. That's the same way for us, right? We are sorry a lot of times because we get caught. We're sorry for the things that sin brings in our lives. But we're not sorry for the sin because we like the sin. It feels good. And so a lot of times we have worldly sorrow just like they had worldly sorrow. And ultimately, worldly sorrow is selfish, right? Worldly sorrow is self-centered. It's centered around how I feel I'm mad because I don't feel good now, because I'm getting in trouble, because I'm having consequences. Whereas godly sorrow is sorrow over sin itself because of what sin is. Godly sorrow is sorrow over sin itself because of what sin is. Godly sorrow grieves over sin because sin is against God. Okay, godly sorrow grieves over sin because sin is against God. So godly sorrow produces repentance, not regret. Godly sorrow produces repentance, not regret. We know what repentance is, right? When we're going into sin and we're actively doing sin, repentance is turning away from that sin and turning toward God. So godly sorrow produces repentance, not regret. Regret is like, I feel bad because of, I don't like myself because I got myself into this mess and, and we just wallow over ourself. Whereas repentance, we're walking away from our sin, we're walking to God And God is giving us the grace and peace to walk through that. So when we have true repentance and understand our forgiveness and salvation, we should have an overwhelming thankfulness, an overwhelming thankfulness to Christ for bearing our sin upon the cross. So when we understand our sin, we should have sorrow over the sin itself, not the consequences of the sin. And godly sorrow, we should have thankfulness for who Christ is and what he has done for us. So, Worldly sorrow is, nope, not there yet. Worldly sorrow is self-centered, hates pain, hates self. Godly sorrow is Christ-centered, hates sin, loves Christ, okay? Worldly sorrow, self-centered. Godly sorrow, Christ-centered. So God's purpose in sending this prophet is to move Israel beyond that regret to repentance, Right? They feel bad that they don't have any food or anywhere to live, but they don't feel bad that they have idols in their house and they're worshiping them. Okay, We need to understand that. He wants to bring them to repentance, not just regret. So three big things for us about this godly sorrow, worldly sorrow thing. The, the first thing is to evaluate our sins. When you, you need to evaluate your own sin, right? When, we, when you think about the way that you react to sin in your own life, you know, are you sorry for the sin itself? 
Or are you sorry for the consequences of getting caught or what the consequences of the sin bring in your life? Are you sorry for the sin itself or sorry for the stuff that it brings? And the second big thing, listen to God's word, right? God's people cried out for a miracle and he sent a sermon, right? Catch that. He, they cried out for God to do a miracle and bring them out because they'd seen miracles before. They remembered, like, they've forgotten who God is and who they are because they have idols in their house, but they didn't forget the fact that God split the Red Sea and God brought the walls of Jericho down. Like, they know that God can do miracles. And so they called out for a miracle, but God sent a sermon first. Right, And so this has to be an indication of just how important the word of God is for us. So we need to listen to God's word. As the people of God, we cannot get away from the study of God's word. Here's a quote, another quote from Tim Keller. That is where we learn who we are. That is the means through which God brings spiritual renewal in our lives. That is the means by which God brings spiritual renewal in our lives through the word of God. We need to be people who listen to God's word. The third thing, discern between setbacks and getting stuck. What's the difference in a setback and getting stuck? Somebody help me. Setbacks are temporary, yes. Getting stuck can be temporary too, we hope. But setbacks are... Right, yeah. So like I sinned today. I messed up. I did sin X, okay? I messed up. I sinned. It's a setback in my walk with Christ, right? My walk with Christ, I'm trying to become more like Jesus each and every day. So a setback is I sinned, I did sin X, and I failed, and that's a setback. Getting stuck is I sinned, I did sin X today, yesterday, the day before, and the day before that, and the day before that, and I keep saying I'm gonna fix it, and I'm gonna do better, but I keep having this pattern of sin in my life. It's the same sin, it's a pattern, and so that's getting stuck, Because you're not progressing. You're not getting over that sin. You're stuck in the pattern of sin. And so there's a difference between setbacks and getting stuck, right? Is anybody familiar with Lord of the Rings? Anybody? Yep, we got like half. Okay, so Frodo and Sam, catch this. What? That's why I was talking about Hobbits, because this is in my mind. Yes, but also the gold and the dragon. That's, you know, this made sense. So we've got Frodo and Sam. If you don't know who that is, it's okay. Just know these guys were on a journey. That's the thing. So we've talked about the Christian life as a journey before. Frodo and Sam, Lord of the Rings, great movie trilogy. Don't know about the books. Can't read a book that big. I struggle. So (laughs) Lord of the Rings, Frodo and Sam, they're on a journey. They have a purpose, right? They have a goal. They have something specific that they're trying to do, right? Back me up if you know Lord of the Rings. All right, what's the goal? What are they trying to do? They're trying to destroy the one ring because they're saving the world, right? It's awesome. So our goal as believers is to glorify God, right? That's our goal. We're trying to glorify God. We'll talk about that in a second. But Frodo and Sam, they had this goal. Now, did they have any setbacks? They had all, (laughs) yes. They had all kinds of setbacks, right? But ultimately, they kept going. They kept pushing forward. Setback after setback after setback, they kept pushing forward even though it looked like it wasn't going to happen, right? So they keep going. And so our job as believers, our goal, that end goal is to glorify God. Ultimately, it's to glorify God in everything that we do is to glorify God in all things and to make him known in all, to all people, right? So we do this by becoming like Christ. He was our perfect example. So he's the perfect example of living in a way that glorifies God. So our goal is to glorify God and make him known to all people. And so we're trying to live like Christ. And so as the student ministry of Beaver Dam, if you haven't caught it, I say this a lot. I say that we are trying to help you know your God and live your faith. And so the reason I say that is because I'm confident that if you know your God from the word of God and you know how to live your faith, then you're pushing on to that goal that is all of our goals as believers, right? You're pushing on to glorify God and make him known to all people. If you know your God and you live your faith, you're doing that. You're glorifying God and you're making him known to all people. That's the goal. So that's what we're pushing forward. So knowing God comes from the word of God. The word of God helps us live our faith and living our faith helps us glorify God and make him known. So 
Hopefully you catch that. So there will be setbacks. There will be setbacks as we push on to that goal. Setbacks are like sin and temptation, all that kind of stuff. But we need to pay attention and not get stuck, right? That's the point. So there's setbacks. It's gonna happen. We know that. We're still stained with sin. But don't get stuck. Stuck is a pattern of sin. Israel had this pattern of disobedience, right? Specifically, it was idolatry. They had carved out idols of other gods in their house. They had this pattern of disobedience. And so, do you have recurring, ongoing sin in your life? We need to identify that. You need to know what that is. You have to evaluate yourself. And so, you need to know, do you have this ongoing, recurring sin in your life? So, let's get back to Israel. The results. So, after the sermon, did Israel repent? We didn't read that part, but hopefully you read it. Wait, is it today or tomorrow? It's tomorrow. You haven't read it yet. So, if you're in the Bible reading plan, and you need to be, you're going to read about this tomorrow, but you're going to find out that no, they didn't repent because they've still got the idols in their house, right? They're blowing it. They're messing up. And so, no, they didn't repent. And so, uh, verse 6, 11, chapter 6, verse 11 shows the call of Gideon, right? So, so God sent this sermon from this prophet, and then he calls Gideon to be the judge, right? To rescue the people. And so, he calls this judge Gideon into power to to help Israel to get them through it, but they didn't repent. So the chain of events shows us something about how God works. It shows us something about who God is and how he works. We need to know that. God does not wait for us to repent before he begins to save us. That is so important for you to know and understand. God does not wait for us to repent before he begins to save us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, while we were still sinners, What happened? Does anybody have that verse memorized? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ did not wait for us to get clean and get away from our sin and make up for all the stuff that we've done in our lives. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that God does not wait for us to repent before he begins to save us. Tim Keller says this. He says, God does not save us because of our repentance. Rather, we repent because he has begun his saving work in us through the external work of his son and the internal work of the Holy Spirit. Please catch that. God does not wait for us to repent to save us. Rather, we repent because he has begun his saving work in us. We repent because he's already begun the work. So the next thing we're going to see is that God is holy and merciful. God is holy and merciful. So through passages like this in the Bible, we see God's mercy. How does this show God's mercy? Just in general, even though we didn't even read the whole chapter, just what you know about it. What? He brought them a judge anyway, right? They didn't repent, but God brought them a judge to bring them out of that oppression, out of that struggle that they're in. He saved Israel even though they were still disobedient because God is a merciful God, right? God has standards. He defines, he literally is the definition of what is right and good, right? He defines what is right and wrong. His standards show us what is right and anything that falls short of those standards is wrong, So God defines what is right and wrong, and he rightly punishes sin. He has the right to do that. But God continues to reach out and provide rescue for those people who have broken his commands, right? He still provides rescue. So we're no better than Israel. We fail, we struggle, we fight sin, we continue to fall into patterns of sin, we keep being disobedient, but God right? While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. And so hopefully this points you to mercy. Hopefully this shows you who God is. Um, As the band comes up, I'm going to pray really quick. And then we're going to go to small groups after, after this. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you for the gathering of, of these students. God, I thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. God, I, I pray that you would convict us by the spirit and through the word. God, show us where we're falling short in our lives. God, show us where we are not measuring up to what you have called us to be. And God, help us to repent of those sins. By the Holy Spirit, move us to repentance. God, help us to live lives that reflect 
your majesty and your mercy. God, give us a heart for the lost and a passion for pointing people to Jesus. God, make us sorrowful over sin, not just the consequences of it. God, mold us and shape us into the people that you want us to be, people that embark on your mission, people that go to where you call us to go. God, I pray that we would be a people who are passionate for your glory and your gospel. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.